Emmy, welcome to the podcast, or I should say Dr. Emmy Garzito. <laughs> welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you today? Uh, I'm great. Thank you for having me. I couldn't be more thrilled. You work in an area that is a passion of mine. When it comes to conflict, resolution of conflict, working on conflict, the inner struggle, mm. the forgiveness of self, mm. and, you know, on and on. Yeah, I'm so passionate about this, so I'm so excited to talk to you today. You are joining us from British Columbia. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. And I, Melissa, I share that passion, so I look forward to our dialogue. Well, let's just jump right into it, shall we? Okay, let's. Yes, let's. Awesome. You know, so many times people will come to me as a pastor. I'm a pastor. Did I tell you that? Yes. Yeah. For 20 some years now. And they will talk about a situation that is difficult or it's uncomfortable. There's conflict. And the conflict is always a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And it's always something they want to fix mm -hmm. and that other people need fixed. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say about that situation? <laughs> Um, well, I mean, I, I think I'm going to start by saying it is inherently part of our biology to both have conflict and to hate it. So the response is very much part of uh, our, our hardwired system. And some of it works for us and some of it works against us. Uh, so some quick thoughts on, you know, my orientation, just so that people are uh, aware. Uh, conflict is an exa a key factor in any organism that is alive. In other words, if we are living, we will experience conflict. So I think it's really important for us to just start with the get-go that this is this is not a terrible thing the pain might be the discomfort or how it gets handled can be traumatic but the fact that we are in conflict means that we care so if i'm fighting with my husband it means i care you know the opposite of love what i tell my clients the opposite of love is not hate, because hate is still an investment. You want something. The opposite of love, yeah, is indifference. So there's there's an opportunity there. I love that. Yeah. So can I just add to that? Yeah. Absolutely. So my one of my favorite definitions is from Dan on Perry, who says conflict is an opportunity for intimacy. And when I first, yeah, exactly. When I first heard him say that, or when I read that, I just remember being blown away because in my personal life, it has always been seen as something very dangerous, something that means that you're wrong, that you are bad. And, um, Dan on Perry just flipped that and said, here, whenever there is a space of disconnect or conflict, there is a space for healing, for being better than, for being more than. The challenge is what is in the way of that space, that healing, that intimacy is vulnerability. And that's the pain point that we struggle with. Absolutely. Who enjoys being vulnerable? Nobody. <laughs> Said so, no one I ever. Make, yeah. 
I think we should make a distinction right up front that we're not talking about an abusive situation or the extremes when it comes to conflict, because those are different conversations. Exactly. And so we're not talking about how people manage conflict, because that's where we get into trouble. That's where we get the abuse and whatnot. It is, um, it is what is it exactly? Right. Mm -hmm. So conflict is telling us something is wrong and needs and needs our attention. It's information, like all our feelings are information. And there is something that needs our attending. So if I came to you and mm -hmm. talked about a situation I was having, say with coworkers, mm -hmm. where would you have me start in that? So that's a great place for us to start. And that would be where I start is by, again, asking a lot of questions about you, the client who's coming to see me. You can't fix other people, but you can fix, learn, and understand and appreciate you. And when any piece of the ecosystem changes, the entire ecosystem changes. So I, I, I start with you and I start with trying to ask questions that will help identify your own internal conflict. So I talk about so your that's pain be first. Hard first. Oh, absolutely. Because yeah. I'm and coming so, to you and I want you to fix these people. Exactly. These people around me need fixing. Exactly. And I probably expended a lot of time and energy so far right. trying to get that done. And then right. you're telling me, wait a minute, turn yes. that focus inwards. Exactly. So the most powerful tool you have is you and your internal ecosystem. And we know that that's uh, true even more in terms of what we're learning about our neurobiology. So the more we learn about the hard science of uh, how our cells, how our brain works, the more we realize how powerful your feelings, your experiences are in the community that you serve. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a big example because I, I work in schools and with children. And uh, you may have uh, spoken with other uh, individuals or through your own studies about stress contagion. So we know that the person who has the biggest ball of power in a space, their internal nervous system has a huge impact on everyone around I mean, and that's true for everybody so if i'm in a uh, i'm in a family of five everybody's nervous system matters but the person who has the most power matters the most so it's very important that we speak from what we can do first so in the case of a classroom the first thing a teacher needs, needs to do when they see a dysregulated class is they need to manage their nervous system first. So it's backwards. We're used to, even in our teaching, we say we have to control our classroom. We have to manage that ecosystem. And what we're learning about our brains is that the fastest way to do that is to face your students and manage your nervous system. So I'm going to give you an example of what that looks like concretely. And just stop me because, you know, like I, I get so jazzed up and excited when I talk about this. Same. I might interrupt you 43 times. <laughs> so in this example, um, the, the old way, the way we were taught with classroom management would be to... Uh, focus on the students, or maybe even say, I see Jeffrey breathing and calm. Thank you, Jeffrey. I see Jessica, you know, uh, sitting down on the carpet. Thank you, Jessica. Whereas now 
um, the, the way that we would work with teachers to, to help classroom management is we would say, what are you feeling? And manage your internal nervous system in front of your class. So when I'm in the classroom teaching and there's a dysregulated class, I'm going to go, wow, it's really noisy in here. And I'm a little bit nervous, so I'm going to shake my hands and I'm going to take some deep breaths. And as I'm doing this, I'm, I'm facing them and I'm saying out loud what I'm doing. And it is incredible how quickly students will begin following your lead and uh, using your own, their own techniques to manage themselves. So your neurons, yes, <laughs> exactly, and to do what we see, so and feel, yes, yeah. That yeah. sounds like anxiety is really contagious. Absolutely, and that amps up the story of conflict. So, conflict starts. I, I'm going to use a big generalization, but it's a. Um, I think it's a good place to start. I'm in conflict when th something you said or done or something I've experienced hits at some vulnerable spot that is very painful for me. That's what conflict is. Because you can tell three different people you're fat and ugly. And one person may take that as a violation. And another person may think that's annoying but have no impact. And another person might look at it and go, that's about you. What is it that you need to pay attention to? Because it's not me. Right? So the conflict is about our own experience. Like where are we attached to our pain point? That's why our loved ones are so fabulous at helping us get those triggers going and helping us uh, reach those pain points <laughs> very effectively. Now, from what you're saying, I get a picture of leadership as one who is very calm, who is very connected, and who is able to just kind of step into the situation calmly and relate to the people in that system from that place of calm that that would spread then and counteract the anxiety. And I would, I would highlight that you are aware and you're willing to be aware of your body sensations because that's where all our feelings start. They start in our nervous system, in our body. It's not a head thing. It's a body thing. And in fact, I'm going to add that all our moral practice is not a brain thing. It's a body thing. So that the more, and, and I see my, my PhD was in moral education and conflict. So I'm very interested in what, like, how do we help people do the right thing? How do we help people get along? And that moral practice is what you said in terms of it's what we do it's what we see the people especially our leaders our the people like our parents people who we uh, endow our largest amount of trust and safety to what they do what they feel and how they manage it is how you how you are what you are teaching moral practice doesn't happen in what you say it's not in it's not in the words of the commandments. It is in the experience. So if I, I'm going to use sort of that biblical reference. An example that has meaning to me is that um, Jesus, the biblical Jesus, practiced had an enormous moral practice where it was what he did, 
what he experienced, but developed relationship before speaking of a rule. And that's, that is how we, this is how we learn our moral practice. It's through what we see the others around us, especially those that we trust. What are they doing? What are they modeling? And how do we feel? What are our feelings? Are we in danger? Do we feel safe? You know, I can see a scenario where there's a spider and there's a young child. And in one scenario, the adult present says, there's a spider. Mm -hmm. That's going to elicit a response, Mm -hmm. probably more like a fight or flight response Mm -hmm. or that type of response in both of them. Yeah. A different adult in the same scenario might say, there's a spider. The same exact words, but their experience of it and their actions around it create a completely different experience for that child. That is um, a beautiful example. And that's exactly what we're speaking to, that we're always wanting to build uh, the conditions that help our bodies learn what it feels like to be safe enough to be dangerous. That is quite a sentence, to feel safe enough to be dangerous. Now, I use it a lot. It's uh, Augusta Boal's term, and it is uh, one that he used to look at, like even in uh, liberation theology, is ways in which to... um, help build communities that would be able to speak to the ugly in the culture and to move forward. So, yeah, so that's, that's sort of my, that's my hope. Like what, how can we help workplaces, schools, families, communities, uh, sit sit alongside discomfort and still show up, right? Not leave the room, not ask, not ask the discomfort to leave the room, that we get to all sit at the table and find a way. You know, Albert Einstein, I'm pretty sure I'm attributing this quote correctly. And by quote, I mean a terrible paraphrase of a really wise thing he said. But he said something to the effect of that the person we are when the problem was created, that's not going to be the same person that finds the resolution. That we have some growing to do. We have some new thinking, some new vulnerability, some new expectations, some new actions (laughs) to do in order to find a solution. And when you're talking about group building, community building, it struck me that we do a lot of this is what I think. And the other people will say, this is what I think. Mm -hmm. But the growth happens when we can sit together and say, okay, this is the, this is the different ways that we think. What does that point us to beyond that? What's that new growth? that new learning, that new mindset and understanding that will propel us forward. And it's not a comfortable process to get there. And you each have to be willing to be vulnerable and honest in order to get there. That's hard work. That is, you know, it is hard work. It's hard work. And it is work. It, I, it's and in the phrase I like in the paraphrase of Einstein's um, quote, which I think about a lot too. Like, and I equate it to like the paradigm shift. It's like we can't think of this in this paradigm, and I I feel like we're in the midst of like some mother loads of paradigm shifts right now. Hey. And the yeah, and the one. In in terms of conflict is uh, what you just said, you know, we're taking these positions 
this is how I, what I think, this is what I think. And we get positional and then we try to understand and hear, okay, so this is what you think. This is what you think. The paradigm shift for me in the way that we're at looking at conflict is this is how I feel. Hmm. And this is where I feel it. So that we become aware and own our, our experiences, our pain, our point of view and our position. Not from a place of the right and wrong, from the rule, from the box, but from my body. That's the paradigm shift that I think we are working at making. I love that you mentioned that. I worked with a friend of mine recently, and we did a whole series on how the body is feelings embodied, how disease is dis ease. Mm. It's those feelings in our bodies, and they get stuck in there. Mm. You know, if I'm angry with someone or harboring a grudge against someone and I walk into a diner expecting to meet a friend and looking forward to having a great time and see that person in the front of the diner, oh, it immediately elicits a visceral reaction in my gut. Right. Yeah. And to the extent that I can release that, it's going to have an effect on my afternoon. 100 percent yeah and if i'm feeling stress out my shoulders and neck Mm. really tighten up if i'm fearful my lower back i really feel it there i i think there's so much power and potential in what you're saying that identifying our feelings as parts of our embodied experience has tremendous potential Right. So what are next steps? If we realize that, what, what do we do with that? Yeah. So here are my thoughts on that in a nutshell. Uh, your conflict did not start yesterday. It is not an overnight thing. It took years, sometimes your lifetime, sometimes generations beyond your lifetime in the making there is not a quick fix and so that's one piece it the, you you we our communities need to play the long game so that's one piece the second piece so so the biggest piece of the long game is don't look to fix something overnight because ultimately what we're trying to do is I'm my I'm in pain. I want this pain to go away. I don't want to own it. I want to give it to you. You know, in another level, that's what every conflict's about. And the work, that hard work that we're talking about, Melissa, is oh no, this is mine. What part of this is mine? Uh, what do I need to be accountable for? You know, what is my piece here? It's you know, if somebody hits me, you know, randomly, that's not okay. But I still need to own my, what I'm going to do about it and how I'm going to respond. So if we change our relationship to conflict, if we change our behaviors and attitudes toward it, is that what you're saying will cause, will bring about transformation in us and maybe those we're connected to? Yes. And the first piece is there, there's some real pragmatics. Uh, so the first piece is, uh, what's happening for me? What, oh, somebody, somebody just called me ugly. Whoa, what's happening rather than like, cause my biology is going to want to punch him or hurt him more than I feel my pain. That's my biology. I have to work against my biology to go inward and say, you know, what's my experience? Ouch, that hurt. Where does it hurt? Uh, It's like a sucker punch in my gut. Okay, I'm going to take some, like, to just really take some time to pay attention to your body and to 
to manage that piece. So to me, that's the number one practice we need to get good at is ask ourselves a couple of times in the day, Amy, how am I feeling? Okay, I'm feeling, I'm feeling relaxed. Okay, where do you feel it? Uh, I feel it, I feel it in my chest. I feel it in my throat. I f- it feels like I can take a deep breath. That's it. That we get really good at becoming aware of what our body is saying to us. Thank you for that. That is one takeaway, one piece of homework that we can do from this mm-hmm. podcast is to ask ourselves, what am I feeling? Where am I feeling it? Yeah. Love yeah. that. Now, I was nosing around on your website because I do a little bit of cyber stalking. <laughs> By a little bit, I mean, well, let's not go there. Anyway, I love all that you have to offer there. And I downloaded the free conflict resolution. Mm-hmm. Am I naming that correctly? I don't believe that. The conflict, conflict Alchemist Handbook. Conflict Alchemist Handbook. Thank you. There is so much good stuff there. I mean, if somebody wanted to do a deep dive, there's yeah. so many opportunities there. So much yeah. to learn. So much to incorporate. Yeah. Folks, the link to that is in the show notes. Make sure you go to Dr. Emmy's website and check out well, everything, but make sure you download that. You don't have mm-hmm. to enter anything. You don't have to enter your name. You don't have to mm-hmm. enter your email. You click a button and there it is. And you can download it to print out. You can download it to have it on your device, but check it out. Yeah, I learned within three minutes so much. So thank you for making that available. Thank you. So we have an action to move forward that mm-hmm. we can do immediately. What do I feel? Where do I feel it? Mm-hmm. And then you've also given this amazing resource that we can use to, for the long game. As mm-hmm. you and that's important when it mm-hmm. comes to marriages and relationships with parents and in-laws and children and, and in-laws going that direction and yeah. the places we work, the groups we're a part of, the yeah. communities we live in. Yeah. It's just endless. It's endless. Yeah. And there's so much conflict right now. Yeah. So much. I'm just going to point to one other piece in that handbook in that there's a page at the end that gives you a whole pile of strategies, like moving your feet from side to side, shaking your hand, rubbing your, your belly. Like there's a, there's a pile of um, strategies and they're very, uh, they, they look physical because a, because m- much of this is here, but all of that is hard research around what helps calm our vagal nerve. And, and again, it is a good practice to look, you know, even if you just check that list out and go, okay, I'm going to work on these three things and I'm going to do them every day for the week and see how that goes. So that you start building your own internal mechanisms and you know you have your own little cheat sheet on what you need to do to manage your nervous system <clears throat> filling up a little toolbox I exactly. love exactly yeah you know we might be in a meeting and it wouldn't be necessarily appropriate to shake our hands but also on that list was just putting our hand over our heart mm-hmm. That's something you can do in almost any context. So right. yeah, check out that list. There are so many good strategies, so many tools for managing conflict, for feeling it, for addressing it. Emmy, you are a huge resource. And I hope that people will check out your information and even contact you because you do really important work. And thank you for doing that. Uh, well, and thank you for letting me speak to this because you um, it's just so important to get the word out. And thank you for the your own work that you do. And I've mentioned this before, but I, I'll just want to publicly say I love the title of your podcast. And I, I just think it is important work to get out there to help communities uh, build that resilience. I appreciate that. 
and changing our mindsets around conflict that it doesn't have to be terrible, but it's a sign of growth. We have mm-hmm. growing pains. It's a sign mm-hmm. that there's growth and potential yeah. that can be helpful. So I'm going to let you have any last words. Do you have any last words to leave us with today? Um, my only other last words are like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of free information on the website. So you can take a look. Um, I think I also gave you uh, the list of sort of my cheat notes. There is, a, I also have a book, Your Beautiful Trauma. And again, it's kind of cheat notes on how to manage crisis. Like if you're in crisis, what do you, what do you do? And it's kind of a step-by-step guide. Um, but you don't have to buy anything. There's lots of material on the website that is helpful immediately. Who's not a big fan of cheat notes? Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Be well and thank you for everything you shared today. Likewise.